Welcome, welcome everyone. Hello. Today's conversation is a fireside chat with Otis Hackney, the Chief Education Officer for the City of Philadelphia. And my name is Romana Lee Akiyama, and I am the Director of the Mayor's Office of Public Engagement. The role of the Office of Public Engagement is to be a bridge between community and the Kennedy administration. And we focus our efforts on ensuring that systemically excluded populations who haven't always had a seat at the table, that they have access and that our government is inclusive and accessible. Today's program is a part of the Black and Gold series. The Black and Gold series is a new initiative that our office launched in February, just a, a few short weeks ago. And it is designed to foster relationships between Philadelphia's Black and Asian American communities. And as a city, we are recognizing all of the great work that's being done in this space to foster these relationships. And we're bringing together community leaders who are committed to be part of the solution to address complex relationships and to move towards healing. I wanna take a moment to introduce my guest today. I'm joined today by one of my colleagues, Otis Hackney. And Otis is the Chief Education Officer for the City of Philadelphia. In this role, Otis launched two major education initiatives for Mayor Jim Kenney, including a city-funded quality pre-K program and the creation of community schools in partnerships with the School District of Philadelphia. Otis also led the administration's efforts to return the school district to local control through a mayoral appointed board of education. This is some very heavy lifting. Um, Otis's role is to provide leadership to improve education in the city. And during Mayor Kenny's second term, Otis spearheaded the Octavius Cotto Scholarship, a new initiative to strengthen the partnership between the city and the Community College of Philadelphia, which makes post-secondary education free for first-time, full-time students. Otis follows the guiding principle that all students deserve high expectations with high support, as well as great schools close to where they live. Otis was the principal of South Philadelphia High School, where he helped heal racial divisions and fostered a collaborative, welcoming environment, successfully guiding the school through three years of compliance with the US Department of Justice consent decree. Otis, thank you for joining us. And uh, before I turn it over to you, I'm gonna give a little bit more context for today's conversation. Sure, sounds good. Yeah. Well, recent events, particularly the attack that happened on the SEPTA Broad Street line in November of last fall have reminded us as a community and as a city that despite the tremendous amount of healing that has happened in the past, we still have some work to do. Um, and for those of you who didn't see this video that went viral, um, what we did see, for those of us who saw the video, um, was a group of young African-American girls involved in an altercation with a group of young Asian-American teenage boys. And you also see a very young, um, brave Asian-American woman who we later learned was a high school senior at Central High School. She attempted to intervene. And um, then she gets dragged into it and is pr pretty um, severely beaten and assaulted. And it's, it's a particularly painful video to watch. Um, and many say they can't even watch it. Um, you know, and what erupted after that video was just years and years of trauma and pain from, from both sides and both communities, both the African-American community and the Asian-American community. Um, what it showed us is that there's just tremendous pain and trauma. So uh, many people after watching that went right back to the memories of what happened at South Philadelphia High School in, in 2009. And that's why we're here today having this conversation. Um, I've invited what I call the master of the playbook. Otis, I keep telling you that you wrote the playbook on how to get through some of these really, really um, sensitive areas and, and do it with so much grace and humility. So we wanted to talk with you today, Otis, about the previous work that you've done and what we can learn from it in this current moment. And our hope is to really uplift the ways that the youth and our community um, themselves and our residents have addressed some of these complex situations and, and race relations. 
So Otis, thank you again. I yes. so appreciate you and everything that you've done and, and your, your wisdom that you're going to share with us today. Talk to me a little bit about what brought you to South Philadelphia High School in 2010. You did come after the, the incident happened. So I just want to clarify that, but let us know what, what brought you there. Right. Um, so before we get started, thank you, Ramana, for, you know, providing this platform for me to talk about, you know, the work, um, about the importance of, of, of this issue and, you know, what we can do to address it um, and create better relations, uh, you know, um, you know, among the students. And so um, what brought me to South Philly and, and just a caveat, and I think we talked about this in a little pre-conversation. I was there one year as an assistant principal about three years prior to that. So I actually had an actual view of what the state of the school was like um, before. And so, and I was an assistant principal there. So it's different. It is very different. People say, well, you're in a leadership role. It's like, yes, but when you're not, when you're the principal, you really get to set the tone for the building. Um, and then I left and then I came back. And when I came back to um, South Philadelphia High School as principal, yes, it was after the events that took place back in December of um, 09. And um, it was definitely to address the, the, the tone, um, the climate of the school and look at academics. I mean, so, you know, I'm a math teacher by training um, and, and came up through the, you know, the district and professionally. And so wanted to make sure that we could create a safer environment for all the students in the school. We could address, um, you know, the academic challenges of children in the school. But it was definitely how I know from the leadership of the district at the time, they were looking for someone who could come in and manage the complexities of the issues at South Philadelphia High School. Um, and so, you know, I was fortunate or unfortunate, <laughs> like depending on how you look at it, to be chosen because people were like, because I was a principal in a suburban district right outside Philadelphia, which was a, a wealth, much wealthier district than Philadelphia. And people were like, why are you leaving the burbs to go back to, to Philadelphia, especially in such like at that time, it probably is one of the worst jobs that any leader could take in, in the country. Like in Ramada, you know how big it was at the time. It was like national news. You know, when I was named principal, my name was showing up. I was getting Google alerts for like newspapers in China, like literally like, oh God, how big is this? Um, it, it was a big deal. Um, and so just to provide context for those that are unaware of, you know, what was going at Southern at that time. So I knew it was a major challenge, um, but I also thought I was young enough in my career because I was in, I was still in my um, 30s at the time and thought I was num young enough in my career to take a risk and say, you know what, I care about this, the city of Philadelphia, I care about kids. And so how do I, where's an opportunity where I think I can make a difference? So I wasn't quite looking for it, but when it was presented to me, I was willing to take on the challenge. That's amazing, Otis. I, I love that story. Um, and you also, and when we've talked previously, you've told me about your, your roots in Philadelphia and your experience mm -hmm. and um, knowing some of those nuances walking, walking into it. So tell me, um, how did you approach some of the tensions that were present at South Philly High? So, so one, being, um, uh, I can't even say West Philadelphia born and raised anymore. That has a different connotation nowadays, uh, post Oscars. Um, so, but being someone from Philadelphia, uh, that was born and raised in West Philadelphia. Um, it, I, I had a good context of the city. And my father, who is a proud Philadelphian, is uh, from South Philly. So growing up, um, I would hear stories about South Philly, you know, if we drive through the neighborhood or just had to do some things down the neighborhood or, or interacted with family. I had a good idea of the landscape. Um, I had a good understanding of the racial tension historically um, in that part of, of the city. Um, you know, so as, as a young man growing up for him, you know, being chased from one neighborhood to the next and you have to deal with certain things or growing up poor in Philadelphia. So I would hear these stories um, and then, you know, and I didn't grow up with a lot of resources as well, but they did instill in me, you know, just, you know, certain values that were important to, to them, uh, to my parents. And those were things that I was able to bring to the work. So when I got to South Philly or Southern, as we call it, um, it was one of those things where um, when you're aware of the racial tension and historically it was for me, I was like, okay, a group of students was attacked by another group of students. That's not new. So, and that's how I approached it, right? And when I say that, it's not to, I, I removed the, the, the specifics from the students, 
it was I needed to understand what I was walking into, right? So this is a school where you know you could have had Italian students fighting Irish students back in the day, or you know Irish students fighting black students or Polish students. Like this is something that has just happened. And this school, by the way, South Philadelphia High School is more than 100 years old, right? I think it's around 110 years old now. Um, and so this is a school that has also always dealt with uh, racial issues. And it's also a part of Philadelphia where, you know, new immigrants have come into and a lot of them were located in South Philly. And so South Philadelphia High School traditionally has always had a mix of students and they've had to deal with racial strife. What I think set this, this um, incident away, separated it from um, previous incidents is, you know, it's, you know, uh, 2009, we have the world is a lot smaller because of communications and social media and the power of student voice in these conversations, I think elevated all of this. So that way it did put it on the forefront. Um, and so those are things that I, that I was aware of walking into the door from day one. So it helped me to gain some context to just the, situ to the overall situation um, what I didn't know is obviously all the specific details of what happened, you know, the previous year. I wasn't there that day. So when, when people ask me about it, they're like, well, what happened? I'm like, I don't know. I wasn't there. And the reason why I say that, and it's very intentional, because from working in schools for a long time, even, you know, reading the Department of Justice report and other reports, it's always still always more to a story. Right, it's always more to an incident. It's not two sides, it could be three sides, four sides to an incident. And you're trying to synthesize all of this information and just saying, okay, what happened and how do we how do we address it so that way it doesn't happen again? And so, but that was my mindset walking in. So I said, let me get some fresh eyes on it and then let's figure out what we can do moving forward. Thanks, Otis. Um, and just context, I think, too, for our um, listeners who may have not even been around in 2009 and didn't know what happened. And I know that you said like you weren't there, but mm -hmm. can you tell us like what was the, um, um, I guess, the, the headlines of the news? Well, just so we get a sense. Right. It, I mean, it was an incident where uh, there was there was a precipitating incident that happened like the day or two before, like everything blew up. And that was, that's always been sketchy for me because I've heard so many different versions of that. Um, but in terms of the headlines, basically it was, and how it was framed as well. And, and, and these are pieces, like I said, I wanted to make sure that I was addressing that, you know, uh, Asian immigrant students, majority Asian immigrant students um, were attacked by African-American students over the course of a day. And it was a, a large number of students were involved. A large number of students were assaulted and a large number of students were involved in terms of, you know, you know, contributing to that, to, to the end or being the assailant. And um, I, I struggled with that, right? So as an African-American person in the city of Philadelphia who cares about African-American people, right? When I, when I see those headlines and, and how, things are painted, right? You feel horrible for the victims because nobody should ever have to deal with that, right? So no one should ever have to endure that just for being in a certain place at a certain time and looking a certain way. Like no one should ever have to endure that. But it also looked at just like, okay, what are going on with this dynamics between, you know, the black and Asian students and, and why is it happening at this school more so than other schools? So is it is it a thing between black and Asian students or is it something in the school, the climate, the culture, rules, policies that's creating an environment that, that, that uh, supports this type of behavior? And that's how I wanted to look at it. Um, so that way I can, you know, cause it, I have the mindset you don't go into, you don't fix kids, right? There's nothing wrong with the kids. You gotta figure out, okay, what are the adults doing? What are the systems doing? What are the policies that help create this type of environment and creates this type of strife? And once again, when walking in with fresh eyes and thinking about it that way was, you know, based off of the headlines that I was reading uh, with the, the dynamics of the students, um, that's what led to that event. But the other part that I saw was just the strength of Black and Asian students coming together after, right? Like that was, you know, and I know I'm not, I'm not trying to bury the lead, but it was also, I was also able to watch it from afar because I was a principal in another district. And so you started to see these events and see students coming together and talking about what, you know, we don't want our school to be this way. So that was like a ton of inputs that I was receiving and how I process information of, okay, there are a number of students that, that cross the demographics that are just like, 
this is not our school. This is not how we want to be portrayed. So that was a huge motivator for me to like, okay, I need to go in and try to, if I can, and I mean this modestly, go in and try to fix it. But I knew I needed a team of people to do that. So whenever I talk about this, it's not just me. I know my leadership matter, but it also was just getting the right team and 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 pushing, um, pushing and pulling at times, um, and being pushed by them as well to 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 make the changes that we needed to 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 make the students in the school feel feel safer. Yeah, and that's definitely um, what I've heard when I've talked to now fully grown student leaders who are active in the community now and um, continue to do this work around um, social justice and, and making sure that our systems are accountable to um, to our residents and and. Um, Tell me, so tell me more, when you came into the school, you said you had a, you needed to build a team. What were some of the most important steps that you took to, and you referenced that the students were already coming together and wanted to create um, a system that was gonna, and a place um, that where they were really gonna be able to thrive. What were some of the concrete um, steps that, that you took um, at that moment to, to make sure that um, you were headed in the right path? So there were there are a couple of things that were afforded me and some things that I created. So, you know, they because of the uh, at the time when I started, the, the decree from the Department of Justice was in place. And so we had to make sure that we were accountable to that. So I was um, provided additional administrative support. And I'm very I acknowledge that uh, to do that. But once again, you know what that dynamic was at the time. You couldn't send one person in there alone to do that job. So, you know, I had an administrator who was responsible for the Department of Justice um, and recording um, of all documentations and making sure that whatever policies we were putting in place were followed. Um, I had additional, um, you know, they gave me climate, they gave me a number of things. Some, th some, some things only lasted a year because I'm like, all right, it was actually too much. Because when I got there, I was like, it's, it's too many supportive services that were not coordinated in the line. Um, the other part that, that I did um, and I was lucky, actually, I was appointed uh, July 1. A lot of often principals are appointed. It could happen at any time of the year, but a lot of times it's either in August or it's back in June. But July, it was such a slow time at that time. Um, I was able to just do listening sessions. And so one of the first things that I wanted to do was just do outreach with the, the adults who were the advocates in the space. So I reached out to them immediately and said, OK, who, who are the students and, and where are they? Right, because they knew them and just said, and I would just cold call them. Like I would call the, the, the different organizations at the time and just like, hey, I'm the new principal. And of course they all like, we know who you are because it was all over the place. Um, and I said, I wanna meet with you. And I said, I will come to you wherever you want me to, wherever it is. And that was with, you know, Asian, the, the, the Asian advocacy groups. That was with African-American, um, the, the groups that were supporting the African-American students. So I was crisscrossing South Philly during the month of July. And it was, uh, so imagine, you know, Philadelphia in July, it's hot, it's humid. You know, you're going to some places and some of these advocacy groups, they're not like wealthy organizations. So, it's, you know, some you walked in, they had air conditioning, some you didn't. You don't complain, you just go. And so I would just go and talk to students and they would have a room full of students sitting there waiting. And I just listened to what are some of your issues? What are some of the challenges? You know, what are some of the experiences you've had and what would you like to see changed? Um, and so just listening to that and, and now being principal, being able to say, okay, all right, that's a policy change that I can change immediately. So moving forward, we won't do X. Um, like one of the policies, for example, was if um, a student was uh, assaulted or needed to make a complaint and write a report, students were forced in many ways, and that this was definitely captured in the Department of Justice report, to, to write um, a, a report in English. Now, I, I only speak one language, but I, I know enough about education <laughs> to understand that if English is not your first language, it's very hard to communicate nuance, descriptive words, or whatever you need. Um, and a report to describe an incident. And so one of the first things I did during the summer before even I had my full administrative team, I just went back to the building and said, okay, moving forward, students no longer have to write um, reports in English. They can write it if they're, if they're literate, fluent in their native language, that's what they write, that's what they use. Um, we have interpreters, we can get translation services, we can do all these things to make sure that we can get it in a form that I can read. So I'm totally fine with that. Um, our, our, the most important piece is to get the information that we need so that way we can address an incident and, and appropriately and swiftly. 
um, moving forward. And so it was stuff like that, uh, that we wanted to make sure that we could implement right away. Um, so it was just really listening and identifying some of the problems um, or, or issues in the building. Um, and then listening about, hearing about some of the behaviors that other adults were doing, right? So there were a lot of complaints about kids, but it was more so their biggest complaint was if something would happen and that behavior wasn't admonished or addressed immediately. So that was something, it was just like, okay, wait a minute. Once again, I'm hearing about the behavior of the adults, right? And this is not a knock. So if anyone, once again, you know, um, there's some, there were some great people at, at the school and some just didn't know because you got to think back in 09 or 10, where people's cultural competencies were at the time compared to where we are today. Like if you use a lens today, and even though it's just, you know, a little more than 10 years ago, we have, we have traveled very far in terms of understanding cultural competencies and, and looking at, you know, intersectionality and, and social justice and, and racism. We weren't there back then. Um, and, and so I was lucky enough to, I guess, have the instincts, the guts to whatever, to make some changes before I even understood all of the terms, right? It was just like, this doesn't feel right, doesn't look right, we need to change it. So we would just make those changes. Yeah. And, um, and I know that perceptions that um, both the adults had of students and students had of each other played a role um, into what was happening in the school. Can you talk a little bit more about that and how you were able to uh, unpackage that with them? So one of the things that was that I found really strange, even when I was an assistant principal there, um, was that because of the large population, and just so people have a context for South Philly, when I was principal of South Philadelphia High School, um, it was about 800, 700 to 800 students. So not a super large high school, especially in an in urban area. Um, and my population though, what most folks don't realize is I would have, I had about 32% special ed and 22, 23% ELL students. And there wasn't a lot of overlap between the two. And most of my ELL students or EL students now um, were newcomers. Most of them, vast majority were like, you know, not parents were born. I mean, parents were immigrants, but they were born here. A lot of them were born newcomer students. And so that was the vast majority of my students. Um, so what I would tell people, I said, even before, you know, the Department of Justice decree, because as, as an educator, we all report to the Department of Justice because it's all about civil, civil rights. But even before that decree that was specific for South Philadelphia High School around those issues, I have students who by law deserve some type of specialized instruction. So more than 50% of my population fell into those two categories. That's tough. And when you talk about economic, you know, um, levels, most of them are very low income students, very poor students. So it, it's a tough school to walk into, right? But it's also a school that was packed full of talent. Like that's, I, I've always felt that way, once again, just as a person who grew up in Philadelphia with not a lot of resources, not a lot of this, a lot of that, but I had great parents who instilled some good things in me. So I always recognize there's just talent in people, there's talent in the hood, there's talent in neighborhoods, there's talent. So that I didn't walk in and think of it as a deficit model. It's like, okay, we need to tap into the assets for the student. Um, and, and I just framed that context so that way people understood there was a policy at the time where, and this existed for years, where the second floor, right, the infamous second floor, I shouldn't call it infamous second floor, but there was the second floor because, and that was the, the, the floor for where all the um, ELL classes took place. And so that was the floor just for ELL students. And people probably had good intentions when they first did it. They thought that I guess it would be better to, you know, co-locate all of these teachers and services together. But what happens is it became very segregated. And so you take segregated South Philly, which historically now it's not that today as much. We, we can talk about some of the nuances of that, or what that and how that shows up in different ways, versus the overt segregation of South Philly, you know, uh, historically. And so, but if you take, you know, so African American communities, which have been in South Philly for generations, and now you put them in a school, and you have a school where you're just like you segregate a school. Uh, you don't belong on this floor. Now, all my immigrant students were not of Asian descent, but the vast majority at the time were. And so in, in most cases, it was very easy to identify who belonged on the floor and who didn't. 
you know, how do you identify an American born kid and how they dress and carry themselves versus a newcomer? There are certain things you can just, you know, you can figure that out pretty easily. So, but what would happen is it was, it would be, you don't belong on the floor. And so adults would treat the kids from South, the, you know, the, 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 the students, the non-ELL students a, a different way and it created tensions. And once again, when I say this, I'm not trying to say that it's just blame and this is what made the African-American students angry. And it was, we kept students separate and we never gave them an opportunity to get to know each other. So that's the spirit of, as I looked at this, it wasn't, oh, so the, you know, you segregate the school and now the black kids are mad. So now they're lashing out against the Asian kids because they feel like this, but it's like, what versus how do we put the students together and figure out how to integrate them because we're all part of a larger school community. So one of the first things I did, and I was very careful about it was I broke up the second floor. So it was just like, all right, we're gonna put classes throughout the building because the students need to walk through the schools and we need to figure out how to make them feel safe because there's certain perceptions that, you know, and, and I was very straightforward. And I know when we talked to previously, it was, I wanted to explore, you know, cause people would always say, well, how did, you know how do black kids see Asian kids? And I said, well, how do Asian kids see black kids, right? And it's not a, it's not a this or that type. I said, but if you don't, if you're not willing to have that conversation and also coming at it with the right spirit and energy, Right. So I wasn't coming at it from a toxic thing or, uh, well, before you talk about black kids and I, well, what are they? It wasn't that it was no, let's really kind of unpack what are some of the differences that we see, you know, because within both communities are colorism. But folks don't talk about that, but it's like, well, let's talk about colorism within the Asian community, because we talk about colorism in the black community. Are there some parallels? Culturally, they're very different, you know, but how it plays out and impacts people, you're like, oh, shoot. There's some parallels there. I said, so, but if people don't want to talk about those things explicitly, how do you say get these two different communities, especially newcomers with, you know, students born in, a, you know, U.S. born stu uh, uh, students and putting them in a school without developing the cultural competencies of, of, of the different groups of students? That's, that's a challenge. And mind you, at the time I had, and I know there's high schools that had more languages in one building, but I had, you know, 24, 25 different languages spoken at South Philadelphia High School. So you're really mixing in a ton of students from all over the world, literally, right? And, and trying to figure out how to put them in the same building, but nobody wanted to talk about the differences and similarities with the groups. And so that wasn't something that I could do from day one. That took some time to get there. I, will, I would never tell someone, don't lead with that question. You gotta establish some credibility first, um, to establish levels of care for all students that you serve before you start raising questions like that. Because if you do it and it goes left on you, then you're in trouble. Like you just opened up something that you weren't prepared to deal with. And so, but those were questions that we were able to discuss and think about over time to, to address you know, the relationship between the students and understand the differences. What are some of the, you know, perceptions? So I, I said, I didn't want African-American students perceived as being like these big, brutish, strong, uh, you know, violent folks. And at the same time, you know, there were these perceptions that Asian students are like these meek, timid. So I said, they're not that either. I said, maybe they're not comfortable in the, in the United States yet. I said, but because when I would see them together, I said, they don't look meek and timid in the lunchroom when they're sitting together. I said, so let's figure this out because they're not. So, you know, let's not put these folks at if extremes and just, and, and talk about strengths and weaknesses or pros and cons. It's like, they're really just kids. And now let's kind of figure out who, who they are, what they care about and, and how we can get them to, to first coexist, you know, cause people do try to figure out, we want them to get along. Like, no, let's just get to coexist first, right? There's steps you need to take and a, and a safer environment. Um, all students feel comfortable to report incidents or whatever, and then making sure that we as adults are doing things differently to get better outcomes and different outcomes from students, um, especially around the behaviors that we wanted. And so those were pieces that we started to put in place to, 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 to begin to shift things um, at, at Southern. Some of the things, there's so much more I could talk about, but we only have a little bit of time. Yeah, no, that's, that's amazing. And, and you're taking us exactly where I wanted to go around um, breaking down the barriers. And, you know, Otis, you are one person, you're one leader in this space, and it takes so much effort to be able to do this. So how did you instill and how did you empower and bring people along who are part of your team to also share this mindset and to um, be able to expand the work more because I can imagine like you're you're one you're the principal right like how right. how did you scale it within your own community? 
So um, there, there's a, a thing that I operate from in terms of in ter just one of my philosophies around leadership um, is one, you, you can't make people do anything, right? No one ever, there's always a choice. Sometimes the choices can be very extreme, but you still have a choice. So my thing is, it's around leverage. My, my philosophy is around leverage and influence. All you have is leverage and influence over people. So what I realized as principal, right? And this can come off a little snarky, but I'm not, I'll be fine. Um, is if all you have is leverage and influence, then, and, and you work hard not to compromise in those things, where do you have the, 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 the most leverage points? And so when I walk into a school, or if you go into any school, if you think about it, everybody is paid to be there but the students. All right, so it's really simple. So that means everybody here, if I'm the principal, that means everybody here reports to me. That's a, that's a strong leverage point. Everybody's here. So the only people who are not being paid to be in the building that we actually have the highest standards for sometimes are the students, and they're not paid to be here. So I need to raise the expectations and the accountability for the adults in the building. And that's what I did uh, because that's a stronger lever, right? A student, I could tell a student to do something. They could look at me and be like, I'm not doing that. And it's really not a whole lot you could do. So, but for adults, it's, okay, this is what we're doing. This is a directive and this is what we need to get done. So it's not making people because they can still tell you no. And there are some people who may have rejected it. So we had to make some changes where they were needed. Um, to make sure that we had a team there, but you're also working to build credibility because at the same time, though, you're looking at your the adults that are in the building, but you have to reward them well for doing the. You have to reward them in in any way that you can, right? You can't give them more money, but you have to acknowledge their voice and say, okay, who are the folks that are on board? What can I do to to help fill you know or um, fulfill your needs so that way you can help me implement this vision? And so it's taking a lot of input from the adults along the way and being and sharing a lot of information with them help bring the adults along that were on board with doing this work. Those that were not on board, we did what we could to make changes when we could, or they eventually their voice was muted down and because folks and students and they were just doing things differently. So another piece that I talk about all the time is like if you want to change the behavior of students, change the behavior of the adults. And so that was the other, like I said, leverage and influence. So what pieces can I influence right away? And that's where those lever those pieces were. So just making some changes on policy. So if I make a policy change, that means if you're an adult in the building, you're supposed to follow policy. So just doing those things and then and holding folks accountable or addressing and admonishing those behaviors right away, including the adults. Now, I wouldn't embarrass an adult, right? But I pull them aside, it's like, that's not going to happen again. Let's make sure that doesn't ever happen again. Um, cause you don't want to, sometimes you don't want to undermine everybody and everything, but if there was something that I needed to address right away in front of the student body or in the hallways of the adult, I'm like, Whoa, wait a minute, let's stop. You go ahead to class and I'll deal with that. And sometimes the kids are like, Ooh, you're in trouble with Mr. Heck. Oh, well, oh, well, because we do it to kids all the time. If, we, if a student does something in the hallway and, and I see them and I admonish and the kids might say, Ooh, you're in trouble with Mr. Why are we as adults, you know, excluded from that accountability? Because we're all just people in this space just because you know so it was really being able to take that level of risk with the adults and with the kids but understanding the spirit of where i was coming from because i was still trying to always be an active listener so even if the adult was upset that well the adults get upset when you do that in front of the kids i'm like okay then let's stop doing that but what are some of the other issues that we need you know that i can do to support you in that and, and, you know, so there were trainings that we had around diversity at the time, um, you know, we, that we did with the adults. There were trainings that we did for the students and, and um, you know, it, uh, assemblies, but I always struggle with those because, you know, you have a few hundred kids in the room. That's just hard to give them a meaningful training. So I really wanted to focus on the adults and making sure that when you're in your classroom and you see these things, admonish the behavior, and, but don't just direct it towards one group. Right. So if an Asian student does admonish the behavior, if a black student does admonish it, like we got to make sure that we're we're levying our taxes evenly um, across the board. Um, and when I say that, you know, and, and I understand the, the, the difference between equity um, and, and equality. Right. So I understand that. But it was we had to address, we had to figure those things out because st stuff was levied a little heavier on black students when there were incidents between black and Asian students and that stuff builds up and 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 it does create a, a, a toxic environment 
And then you can't even get to what's wrong with the dynamics just between Asian communities and Black communities. Right now, I'm just dealing with these little, now we call them microaggressions or policies that, you know, where students are suspended at a higher rate than others for similar behaviors, because those things, and I observed them when I was an assistant principal, where those things would happen. I'm just like, you, it's, it's, a cow, it's a powder keg and it's going to blow. And it blew. And, and so we were trying to undo that, but once again, do it in a way that supported students and didn't promote one group over the other, but really tried to be very inclusive of, of the students and their voices. Yeah, powder keg, that's a great explanation or a great um, analogy. And I've also heard another community leader talk about Philadelphia as being a tinderbox, right? Just really ready to, to combust and um, little things add up. And I, I think that's what we're, we're seeing today too. And, you know, we talked, you talked about um, Black and Asian students just being okay to, to coexist. And I've also um, heard it talked about like, how can we get used to sharing the space together? Can we just share the space together? Right. Um, and so wanted to ask you, like, what about your time at Southern? Do you think our communities right now across Philadelphia can take away um, and, and learn and adapt in this current moment? One, one is, and, and, you know, depending on the, the context, so across the city, you know, leadership always matters, right? So our leaders have to just get out in front of it. Um, when we think about, and, and, and the, the incidents that are taking place, you know, like right now, let me back up. In Philadelphia, there's, you know, violence is at an all-time high, right? In terms of, I haven't seen it like this since the early 90s, but I remember those days. Um, so it, it, there are certain aspects of it, but this feels very different than that. Um, and then you couple that on top of what some of the dynamics, especially with the previous, when I talk about administration, I'm talking about presidential, the climate that was just created in the country with that administration um, around overall, and then, you know, you get hit with a pandemic and they're height, heightening tensions with, you know, just the, the people in the country versus Asian foot. And then, and then it like morphs into now some of these incidents that we're seeing again on the rise, right? Or, or they're actually, they have risen. Um, and it's like all of these different things. And then you have the other pieces that just haven't been addressed over generations between, you know, you know, for, um, Asian immigrants and Asian Americans, right? Because in, you know, it's 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 like, you know, how do you support a, a, a group where you have folks who have been here for generations, right? There you have Asian folks who have been here as long as and longer, depending on what part of the country and as uh, those who came through Ellis Island, right? And then you have, you know, newcomers. And so how do you figure out, you know, um, especially for newcomers, and that's what I had to deal with at, at Southern is how do we welcome them into the school, but saying these are the cultural competencies that will help you survive or, and I shouldn't say survive, that's a horrible word. And when I say survive, thrive, right? Because it's, it's, and if you know me, you know what I mean by survive. It's not like danger thing, right? Surviving and thriving, right? Is a thing I do all the time. And so how do we do that? So that way you can like survive and thrive in a new space. Because if I, if, if I switched it the other way around, it's like if someone said, hey, Otis, you know, you have to relocate and go to China. All right, I got to figure out a way to survive and thrive in this new environment. Like, I just so what con cultural competencies do I need to learn? I need to figure out the language as quickly as possible, at least listening and understanding before I can, you know, speak freely about. But so when I talk about survive and thrive, that's that's the spirit that I bring. And so I always try to set a context for that because some people will hear like, "Oh God, what do you mean I got to survive?" Like, well, we do. We just have to figure that out. So, um, but it, it's really about. Um, how, how do we get folks in the room and talk about some of these differences so that way, and, and, and a space where it goes beyond coexisting now where coexisting, we're co-planning, we're co-leading, we're, we're, we're living um, together side by side. We, you know, we, all, the, all the fluffy stuff, we wanna be able to see the differences, but also, you know, share at times a, a very common vision. So we're, walk, we're working towards a common goal. And so I think that's very possible today, but it takes a lot of listening. Uh, a willingness to um, say when you're wrong or things are not right, right? And, and do it in, in a way, hopefully that it's safe and they provide you time to address it. Um, and, but people have been dealing with, or dealing with these for so long, sometimes they're not patient, right? And I don't blame them, you know, because if you ask certain, if you ask black folks about certain things dealing with racism, do we have patience for you to fix it? No, we don't. And for, you know, for the AAPI community, certain things are like, we don't have any more patience, right? We want this, this address now. 
And so what are the low hanging fruit that in terms of that are meaningful and impactful that you can change right away? Identifying those things and taking actions right away um, is something that needs to happen um, um, in these spaces. But we also, once again, and I think like this forum and platform that you're creating now is getting folks together in space, having some of these conversations who are the leaders, and then, but we have to take that message past that room or that platform or this space and say, okay, what do we need to do to, 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 to get folks together? Because there's so many spaces when you see young people where they are doing that and thriving. So you're like, okay, why is it working over here but not working over here? In this school, the Black and Asian students get along. They're on the same teams. They're doing this, they're doing that and they're interacting and co-mingling and it's totally fine. And then in other schools, it's not. So what's going on? Um, those are pieces that I think that, you know, we need to highlight more of that to show that these, these relationships can be positive. And then when you have the outlier and then hopefully, right, if, if there isn't, you don't want an outlier incident, but when it happens, there are people that can say, you know what? Okay, we know what to do. We know how to address this moving forward. Um, when I was at Southern, I, I would never promised folks that something would never happen. I said, but we'll, I will promise that we'll take, you know, swift and appropriate action, right? And I always framed it that way in terms of, because people are like, well, you mean swift and appropriate discipline? I'm like, wait a minute, no, hold on. It could, I need to figure out what happened and then let's take the appropriate actions to address whatever the incident was. So sometimes it could be a disciplinary thing. Sometimes it could be, we need to have a meeting and have a conversation. And so, because your whole goal is actually not to discipline or your way through this, it's really about how do I modify behaviors to get the outcomes that we want, right? And when I say I, I mean that in a very small way, not like I as some supreme thing, just as, as a principal, okay, what can we do or what can I do as a principal to modify behaviors to get the outcomes we want? So we need to look at the city and say, okay, what are the behaviors that we don't want to see? And then let's unpack that and what are the things that are creating some of those or forcing some of those behaviors or where people have choices, they send to, send to lean that way, then we need to do something in the systems to kind of address it. So that way you're like, okay, this is, we want to see more of this behavior. It's, it's a science that, you know, there are behavioral scientists that could talk more, you know, expert in an expert manner around these things. But it is something that as a leader, you have to have some understanding of adult behavior or human behavior, I should say, and say, how do we create these, these levers and influence the behaviors we want? Um, and, and that's a lot of work. And it takes a lot of conversation, a lot of smart people to get sit around the table. And then you have to be bold enough to make the changes regardless of, you know, whether it be a contract or some rule, who's willing to change the contract, who's willing to change the rule, before you know the Department of Justice gets involved, so it was it was just taking that risk and not worrying about. So I said, look, if I lose my job over trying to do something right, then so be it. Yeah, and thankfully you were successful, and um, we started to get to this. How do we how do we scale these efforts, right? How do we scale them? It's the biggest question. Once again, so now it just gets down into, you know, we both work in for the mayor's office. And, and so it is looking at policy. And so how do we tailor policy? So that way that that once again influences the people who are employed first, because it's hard to just change the behavior of somebody on the street. They don't, it, it's just hard. So, so do we as organizations, so as the city or as the district or, you know, our corporate partners and folks in the city, do are we doing the things and having the policies in place that support a more inclusive environment a safer environment and then how do we communicate that so that way the people who work for us they either you know they they definitely demonstrate that in the workplace but do it so much that it also they demonstrate it at home or in their communities in their neighborhood so it would be nothing better than if I don't know, you just take some random person and they get some type of diversity training and they go back to their neighborhood and they and they hear one of their friends say so and so, they'd be like, yo, why do you talk like that? Why are you doing that? We don't talk like that. Anymore. Like that's you gotta, it takes time, but you need like the regular person to go back and say to you, like, who even thinks like that anymore? We need to stop. Or when you're sitting around the the, the, the the family table. But that comes from people being very intentional about delivering the messages around intersectionality, diversity, being inclusive. And it just permeates to the point where you're like, oh, okay, I need to think differently about, you know, people who are not like me, sometimes think differently about people who are just like me, like, wait a minute, why are we doing this? How can we 
address that. But it has to come, I think, from a policy. And I know people say, is it a government overreach? And, it's, and as a Black person in this country, I would say absolutely not, because if we don't have certain laws and protect, I mean, we just got an anti-law bill signed. It's a little late for that, in my opinion. I'm glad it was done, but it's just like, when they were lynching a lot of people is when you should have done this. Um, we have other forms that we could, you know, some would, I'm sure, argue and love to debate of today. But it's when you start to see the policies that are um, hot and, and people are held accountable, then you start to see some behaviors. But it's also coming with this, you know, the supports that folks will need and the time they will need to change behavior because it's not an easy thing to do. It is, people think it is, and it's not an easy thing to do to change people's behavior, even within yourself sometimes. I wish I could exercise more, but it's a hard behavioral change, right? I mean, and, and that's, and I, and I say that lightly, but, and, and the reason why I use it, I use it as an example, you know, because some people think, oh, why is it hard? To, it isn't hard to do the right thing. And it's just like, all right, well, a lot of us know that we should eat better and exercise more, but we don't. Why don't we, we know it, but we don't. And I'm guilty of it, right? So I'm not, and so imagine something that's, and, and that's just, and that's for you and your own life and quality of life and health. And sometimes we don't even do that. So let alone, I need you to change your behavior to impact somebody else. That is hard to get people to do that. I need you to change your behaviors because they actually impact somebody else. Whereas some folks here, we can't even change our behaviors that impact us and just us alone. Yeah. So that's how heavy and how much work this is to really think about how do we do that? And, and you have to be consistent and you have to be very clear about what you want and you have to be consistent and, and you can't, and when I say waver, waver back in a negative way, you always have to be pushing and progressing forward. Absolutely. And I like to think about it as, um, you know, we're all kind of swimming in this Kool-Aid of uh, a racist world that we live in, right? Yes. And we're we're swimming in it, it's coming into our pores, we're we're in we're gulping it in. And I every day it's a choice when we wake up how we're going to be in this world. And so when I talk about being an anti-racist, I I say that I'm waking up every morning and I'm making a certain choice that this is yes. how I want to show up in this mm -hmm. world. And these are the choices I'm going to make both for myself and for the people around me, but it's, it's a choice and it's the work, right. right. To, to go yeah. against that, to go against the flow of what our society has been right. Right. For centuries. And it, and it has to be a conscious effort. Yeah. So like I said, and that's why it's, it's like if someone said I want to get up and, and exercise every single morning because I'm making it, it's a conscious decision you have. And then you do it so much so you're like, oh, I have to do it. And so when you when you see things now, you know, so if you're anti-racist, you, you, you're so conscious about it. now you reckon you're like, oh, I have to say something. I have to address it or I need to or and for your own self, I need to. Oh, shoot. I have certain behaviors. I need to stop doing that. You know, so if it's um, you know, I have people on my team, they joke with me all the time. It's always checking. I'm like, OK is this how you say this today or is this how you do that and they're like oh there's no you're pretty good with i said well i still try to be very careful about you know uses of, of pronouns or identifying terms or whatever because it is a shift and you really consciously have to think about it because as you just said it's around us all the time some of it is very you know um overt and a lot of it but a lot of it is covert and it's just all these little pieces of inputs that we take and we have to figure out how to consciously like pull them apart and say, okay, who am I at my core? And what, how do I want to be seen? And then how do I want this to impact others? And a lot of folks just don't, they don't think of themselves in the world that way. Yeah, it's very deep and it gets internalized too, right? About mm -hmm. how we see ourselves. Um, and that's, that's the work to undo all that. Yeah, I just say, start with your own behaviors. If you can figure out how to just, you be a better person, then it's like, okay, that's one less person. That's what, you know, we have to worry about. And so how do we educate more to, so that way they can, you know, get on that path as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to shift a little bit and, um, you know, we're going to have a new superintendent pretty soon. Um, what would you tell this person coming in about these challenges? What is one thing that should be on their radar screen? Um, for the new superintendent, I, I, would tell, I would tell them to just first learn what the issues are, you know, so do whatever diligence they need. Um, do focus groups and listen to adults and the children slash students um, as quickly as possible. So as you start to synthesize your plan, 
it's incorporated and baked into what you're doing. It's not one of those things where you're like, you lay out your vision for the district and you're like, oh shoot, I have this issue over here. Let me figure out how to incorporate that in. Sometimes you can, don't get me wrong, but getting the, as much, as many inputs as possible to say, okay, if this is a key issue for um, a population of students and we need to figure out that, and it's just like, okay, does this impact or other students impacted this way? How many groups are impacted this way? All right, let me start to figure this out. And it's not, and now if it's just one group, that's enough, but making sure that, but if you can find other groups too, okay, what's going on? Are these issues, is now, is it a theme? Is it pervasive across the district? And so, or is it isolated? So do I focus my efforts there? So that's what they're gonna to have to come in and learn um, about the city of Philadelphia, learn about the school district, um, about the different dynamics. Cause we were all, I was, I, I think when you referenced the incident with the, with the um, students on the SEPTA train, I was, I was so triggered and bothered by that on so many levels. It brought back flashbacks to, I was like, and I already knew that's it, folks are gonna be calling me after this. Um, and it was like, oh, oh man, it's happening again, right? And it was caught on video. I mean, it was, it was, it was, and it was shown. And 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 so I was just like, and I felt bad for all the students involved. I mean, don't get me wrong, it was, you know, the 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 I guess she's a young woman now because she's a senior, uh, that was assaulted at the time. And then, but also looked at the, you know, the 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 girls that were involved and in, and in that were the aggressors. And it was just like, and you know, and I know it's it's almost cliched in, in the trauma informed world where you say what happened to them, but you could see it. And as an educator who's been in this space for twenty plus years, you I could see. I'm like, man, what happened to these? Like, what what was that? Because now you're 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 labeled this. You could be charged with this, and these are things that can impact you for the rest of your life, right? Um, and and don't get me wrong, the 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 young woman that was assaulted, that's going to impact her for the rest of her. So now you have all these victims of this stuff that that some things they're not even wholly responsible for that have just happened to them and put them in the same space, and you have this. And so that's where my 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 heart went in terms of like how do you look at it. And so for our new superintendent, they're going to have to unpack some of those things, and hopefully they tap the shoulders of the right people. To get the information that they need to um, begin to think about, okay, what are things we need to put in place to make sure that our students feel safer in schools, they feel safer going to and from school, what's happening within our buildings, because those are environments that we have more control over. So that way, but if we do that well, then that actually does impact how students are, you know, when they leave school. So that it way, it's not just one student stepping up. To, to support a group of students who are being bullied versus it's like all the kids at the school, like, whoa, leave them alone, chill, like relax. And so it's not just one because she was, she was, she was one. And that was, that was an amazing and a brave thing that I don't, I don't care what anybody says that it was just an amazing, brave thing for her to do and step up. Um, and she probably knew the risk, but she was willing to take it. Um, but she should never have to be in that situation. So but sadly, too many of our kids are, whether it's that or other things that they have to deal with here in our city. Um, and so we have to really figure out a better way to support our children. So, but that's what I would talk to the superintendent about. And I think the candidates that we've at this time now, I don't think anything is public, but I'm pretty sure that whoever comes in as a new superintendent, that's gonna have to be you know, a high priority. Yeah, and I hope they call you. I hope that you're on top of that phone call list. Well, I'm the, I'm the chief education officer. I can just call. Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> so, I'll just, I, if they don't reach out to me, I'll reach out to them. So no worries. Good. Thank you. <laughs> um, you know, I want to wrap us up and um, ask one final question. Otis, you know, this work is, it's been so personal for you. It's been personal for me and mm -hmm. um, it's very heavy. It's very, very heavy. And wanted to ask you, you know, how have you grown as a person and, and how, how has this stretched you and where do you see the hope and how does that connect to you and, and what you, um, like how, how you want to be in this world? Um, wow. How I want to be in this world. Okay. That's crazy. Uh, I got to figure out, that's a big question. Um, it, it's, it's been, it's been a crazy journey and it's one of these things that I, you know, and we talked before about this, that is, it is hard for me to unpack, right? Because it is, you know, you, you care about, and I said it earlier, you care about the city, you care about, you know, young people. I, I, I care deeply about their success. I want them to be successful. Um, I, I don't want to be an outlier from my neighborhood, right? So where I grew up, I don't want to be an outlier. I, I, and, and I mean that once again, in a very modest manner, that there should be more making it 
to and through and surviving and thriving. Um, and so when I think about the work and when I saw it, just like when I was triggered by this, the, the incident on SEPTA to even when I was watching, you know, back in 09, when all this stuff was happening uh, before I was principal, it was, it hurts deeply to see children hurting each other. Um, and so how do you, how do you begin to, 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 to just change that. So it has been a, a, a huge emotion, emotional journey um, uh, through it all. That's why I was triggered by that, the, like I said, that last incident where I just felt it in my gut. I was like, oh, this is so bad. This is horrible. Um, it, that, but it does change you. It, it, it provides you, or for me, uh, provided me with a new network of people to, to, to learn and grow about, once again, those differences that I talked about so, and, and thinking about how do we get to a space where we can, you know, sounds cliche, celebrate the differences, embrace the differences, but yet thrive together. Um, and I think about like missteps too, right? I mean, there's some things I know I didn't get right. There should be things on this conversation right now. Someone could critique and say, oh, you, why did he say it like that? Um, and so, but trying to learn from those missteps. And so I, I, I try to take the criticism. Um, I, I never minded, it was never a problem with engaging uh, with people with opposing views, as long as they want to have a conversation. If you just want to yell at me, that's just not going to work, right? But if, it's a, if you want to engage me and say, okay, these are some things that I heard. Why did you say this? What did you, those are the pieces that I embrace because it just helps me grow as an individual. It helps me grow in terms of, you know, me as a leader. Um, and, and the people that I serve. So as long as I'm in a leadership role, I, I think of myself in that way of like, these are the people that I need to serve. I'm, I've, I've been appointed or chosen or whatever to do it. And so I need to synthesize all, all of this information and I need to think critically about the, about the world around me. Um, and as an educator, that's what drives me because I think you know, that's one of the things that we need to make sure that students do. If someone said, what, what should a student do at the end of you know, 12, 13 years, you know, if you go pre-K, all the way through uh, in K um, to 12, it's what do you want people to be able to do? And it's really to, you know, one, take in knowledge, synthesize it and create something new. Like that's like the, um, the highest form of intelligence, right? And in, in many ways is to synthesize all this stuff, think critically about it. And they, can you create something new? So create a new paradigm, a new space, a, a, a new reality. That's, that's what we're trying to do. And that's how it has shifted me. I know it sounds, a little crazy and lofty, but it, it has to be in order sometimes to even get incremental changes, you have to be, think that big about it and, and slowly get it. And I, I hope I get to live to see some of these changes through. And if I don't, but help to be a catalyst for it um, and just play some small part, then so be it. I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with that. Yeah, it's a, it's a story of how we, evolve and grow as individuals and as a society, right? And yes. at this moment that we're in, it's it's an opportunity, right? Um, and the Chinese culture talks about crisis as being also an opportunity. And, and so that's how I'm looking at this too. Yes. So Otis, I just wanna thank you so much for, for being here in this space and for um, your leadership um, in, in the past. And now um, we need you more than ever. And I'm grateful to be in orbit with you. So thank you again for being in this conversation. I know the work is gonna continue. Yes. Um, and for everyone who's been with us today in our conversation, I hope that you've taken away so much from it as much as I have and have hope um, for the future of what we can all do together. And once again, I'm Ramana Lee Akiyama. I am the director of the Mayor's Office of Public Engagement, and this has been part of our Black and Gold series. Stay tuned for more programming throughout 2022. We will be in touch. Take care, everyone. <laughs>